I'd like to thank all of you for attending the uh, annual meeting of the Re Vietnam Respiratory Society. My name is Dr. Roger Kobayashi, and I'm a clinical professor at the UCLA School of Medicine. I'd like to thank uh, particularly Dr. Chow and the organizing committee, uh, to Dr. Well, Professor Fan Mang Hung, who treated us uh, very well when we came to Vietnam over 25 years ago, to my colleagues, Dr. Zung and Dr. Dong at the Military Medical University, uh, to Dr. Hung and her colleagues at the Vietnam um, National Children's Hospital, and particularly to my wife, Dr. Ailan Kobayashi. The topic I will highlight today will be about the problems faced by our predecessors and by ourselves and will confront the young doctors as they go forward in their careers. However, I am very confident that they will build upon our progress made and make the evaluation and management of the child with prolonged fever a much less ominous process. Here are the disclosures. I uh, was uh, full -time on the full-time faculty at the University of Nebraska and at UCLA and was in private practice and took care of approximately 300 patients who I treated with gamma globuli. Fever and prolonged fever was a much feared occurrence 100 years ago and even 50 years ago when I was a young uh, physician starting my journey in the 1970s. However, despite our enormous progress in knowledge, spectacular improvements in diagnostic technology and improved therapeutics, prolonged fever and FUO still present grave dangers to our children and perplex even the most gifted and astute physicians. I would like to emphasize context. The setting and circumstances of the clinical presentation is critical in narrowing the possible causes, and this brief discussion will emphasize a careful history, fastidious detail to the clinical presenting signs and symptoms, leading to a well thought out use of laboratory tests and diagnostic procedures. Let me start with a case from 1975 as a pediatric intern at the University of Southern California. An eight-year-old Mexican-American male presented with a two-week two history of high fever, abdominal pain, anorexia, headache, and rash. The child appeared ill. Our initial impression, of course, uh, being in California, was either systemic GRA, a urinary tract infection, or inflammatory bowel disease. We were not thinking about infection. The laboratory studies showed mild leukocytosis, mild elevation of liver enzymes, and evidence of dehydration. Radiographs, blood, and stool cultures were obtained. Infectious disease and rheumatology consults were asked. Interestingly enough, blood and stool cultures that were obtained revealed salmonella typhi. The patient had typhoid fever. I was surprised but elated that this was something I had studied in medical school but never thought I would see a case. Well, incredibly, not only did I see a case of typhoid fever, but I saw several cases of tuberculosis in children as well, something that we were taught in medical school but never thought we would see in real practice. Unfortunately, I was asked to review all the cases in children in Los Angeles County. I had to present an oral paper on 125 cases of typhoid fever in children in Los Angeles County at the Western Society for Pediatric Research in The causes of prolonged fever are infection, 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 and bacterial infections are by far the most common even in 2022, just like they were 100 years ago. Tuberculosis remains a major problem of prolonged fever. However, endocarditis, bacterial endocarditis, salmonella, as in typhoid fever, the rickettsia, group A strep, abscesses of the deep organs, and particularly urinary tract infections can be occult and make a diagnosis, prompt diagnosis, uh, elusive. Osteomyelitis can also be a problem. Viral infections are also problematic, and dengue hemorrhagic fever uh, and chikungunya are issues uh, in Southeast Asia, 
although EBV, CMV, HIV, and parvovirus are also something that should be kept in mind. Parasitic infections are extremely uh, important, and malaria and others can cause uh, significant problems. Malaria is still a major problem, particularly uh, in the Southern Hemisphere, uh, in Southeast Asia, in Africa, and uh, similar areas. Fungal infections are becoming an increasing problem, especially as we have more immunosuppressed patients, uh, those on uh, immunosuppressive treatments. Infections with unusual organisms such as pneumocystis carinii, uh, histoplasmosis, coccidiomycosis may be a problem, especially in patients who are treated for cancer or the immunosuppressed or patients with immunodeficiency, candida, aspergillus, and cryptococcosis can be a problem. Autoimmune, autoinflammatory diseases are also an issue. Rheumatic fever still uh, is present in parts of the a world and uh, can present as a prolonged fever, systemic juvenile idiopathic arthritis, Crohn's disease, ulcerative colitis are very difficult to diagnose oftentimes, and in the child they may present with prolonged fever, loss of appetite, loss of weight. Kawasaki disease and lupus are less common causes uh, and have characteristic findings, but still can present with prolonged fever. Autoinflammatory and the periodic fevers are less common. Uh, however, they can be uh, present in some of the patients, and if the diagnosis is not made uh, in terms of infection or autoimmune diseases, then some of these, such as familial Mediterranean fever, TRAPS, uh, PEFA, and hyper-IgD syndrome uh, can be considered. Malignancies are always a worry, and they can constitute anywhere from 10 to 20 percent of the children who present with prolonged fever. Cancers of the blood are the prime consideration, and leukemia and lymphomas must be considered. And fortunately, with laboratory studies, uh, the diagnosis can be made. In terms of miscellaneous uh, immunodeficiency, drug fever, CNS abnormalities can cause. Now, this is a world map of infectious causes of prolonged fever, and although it's somewhat complicated with A, B, C, and D, uh, they represent different diseases, and so we'll have you focus on A, B, and D, as in David, and if you look at the upper left-hand corner, A, the red indicates areas where malaria is a major problem, and you can see Southeast Asia, Africa, and parts of Central America, the green uh, indicates leishmaniasis. Uh, in blue on the right upper side, you can see, again, Southeast Asia uh, is involved, and that constitutes Japanese uh, encephalitis. Uh, looking at C, you can see uh, the blue areas, the, mainly in the southern hemisphere, uh, being uh, dengue fever. And going over to the right lower end, violet uh, chikungunya, again affects, the. this is the purple, affects Southeast Asia. And to a lesser extent, the blue, uh, babesiosis, uh, may be an issue. Now, this is a nice paper that was provided to me by Dr. Huen from the National Children's Hospital. This was a paper published uh, in a Vietnamese journal in 2019 uh, at the National Children's Hospital in Hanoi. Uh, and they looked at children uh, with prolonged fever uh, between the periods 2016 to 2018. And uh, infection was the most common cause. Bacterial infection was the most common cause of fever in 65.5% followed by immu immunodeficiency diseases, cancer at 5%, and about a quarter of these patients uh, were uh, undetermined. The important part, thing to remember was that urinary tract infection was the most common cause of the bacterial infections. And so the conclusion from this paper was bacterial infections remain the primary cause of prolonged fever
uh, in children. And this is demonstrated in studies from India, in studies from China, uh, and in studies uh, from Taiwan. Now here is a meta-analysis uh, uh, from a paper from India looking at 18 uh, different papers, and you can see uh, tuberculosis was the most common cause of uh, infection, accounting for about 37%, endocarditis, brucellosis, abscesses, salmonella uh, followed. Uh, if you look on the bottom uh, third of the paper, out of 289 cases uh, from uh, 15 papers, uh, lymphomas, uh, including non-Hodgkin's, accounted for almost 60% of the cases, and leukemias about 6%. So again, infections are the most common, uh, followed by, uh, in this case, uh, neoplasms. Now, we'll go over how to evaluate uh, the patient with prolonged fever, and I think it's easiest to follow the excellent paper uh, by Dr. Atun and others, uh, since uh, I would be reinventing the wheel uh, by going over the diagnoses, I'll, I will, the diagnostic steps. I will, however, interject uh, where uh, our own personal experience and perhaps the literature uh, provides additional information. So evaluation of prolonged fever, typically longer than eight to 10 days, and it depends on whether the patient is well-appearing or not well-appearing. The initial workup uh, would include a CBC with differential, a basic metabolic profile. Uh, that would be very helpful. The CBC, of course, determining whether the patient uh, has an inflammation, is anemic, uh, whether he has a shift uh, with neutrophils indicating a more a bacterial infection or possibly a right shift with leukocytosis indicating EBV and so forth. Metabolic uh, panel might indicate chronic urinary tract infection. Liver enzyme studies, of course, are quite important. And urinalysis is extremely important because of the issue of occult urinary tract infections, uh, which are quite common and sometimes hard to diagnose. If the patient is not, uh, if the patient appears well, uh, ill, uh, then the patient is admitted to the hospitals. Uh, additional things that may be ordered include cultures, radiographic examinations, uh, and uh, uh, ongoing periodic follow-up. If the source is identified, it's treated. If the source is not identified, then we go on to the next step. Uh, we consider the four major areas of causation. Uh, in terms of infection, uh, we would do cultures. Uh, PCR uh, can also be done if it's available. Uh, in young children, uh, especially young babies uh, and neonates, a C, uh, lumbar puncture with CF, CSF uh, evaluation is essential. Uh, titers and serology can be ordered, and a CRP or, or uh, ESR can be gotten. I would add there that a serum protein electrophoresis would be essential. Uh, I use that all the time. I think that's one of the most underused but most important tests. Uh, if it is elevated, uh, if the serum globulins are elevated, that would suggest a significant infection or inflammation. Uh, and I would point out that the gamma globulin should rise. It's an acute phase reaction, uh, reactant that will go up uh, with infection. However, as all of you well know, the first case of immunodeficiency diagnosed by Colonel Bruton at the Walter Reed Hospital in Bethesda uh, looked at a child who had 19 bouts of sepsis. They did protein electrophoresis, and the gamma globulin spike was missing, and they put two and two together and found out that uh, no gamma globulin means he had a gamma globinemia. And so protein electrophoresis would be very helpful. And in fact, if it's not highly elevated or it's low in the face of inflammation, one has to suspect immunodeficiency. Oncologic uh, testing is important as well. Uric acid lactate dehydrogenase, which tells you about uh, cell turnover, is important. Again, protein electrophoresis is important. Uh, if they have lymphomas or multiple myeloma, 
you would have abnormal protein spikes on electrophoresis. The autoimmune or rheumatologic examination, again, laboratory studies would include an ANA, rheumatoid factor complement levels, and other uh, markers uh, for uh, inflammation and autoimmunity. Uh, and I have given several references for more specific tests. Immunodeficiency is not rare, and we've given uh, hundreds of lectures on immune deficiency. And I think the simple thing in all patients who have had repeated infections or prolonged infections where you're not sure, immunoglobulin levels may be useful. Uh, lymphocyte subsets can be uh, uh, useful, and uh, antibody titers to known vaccines can also be obtained. These would be for functional studies. And then, of course, we would want to ask a consultant to come in, uh, particularly an infectious disease consultant, a rheumatologist, uh, and possibly an immune uh, immunologist. So, again, uh, laboratory studies, I think sometimes people get confused when you're doing laboratory studies to look for an offending agent such as an infectious uh, disease uh, microorganism, there is both direct evidence and indirect evidence. And the way I look at it is that the test for direct evidence is that you are actually seeing the culprit. Seeing meaning the fox has bitten uh, or you see the fox going after the chicken. So in terms of direct observation, you can see evidence of the bacteria uh, on microscopic examination. You can see it on culture plates with the characteristic features. Uh, you can culture the bacteria so that you see it. the bacteria is actually there. You can identify particles of the bacteria. You can look at it both macroscopically and microscopically. Or you could do PCR. This is taking small parts of the uh, microorganism. In the, in the old days, we had problems because we could not co either collect enough or it would take too long. With PCR, we can, even with very minute uh, amount of infecting microorganisms, we can multiply them and then come out with the diagnosis within hours. And there are several ways of doing it, PCR, microarray, uh, immunologic methods by ELISA, et cetera, and chemical identification. Indirect methods meaning means that you don't actually see the offending agent or the offending agent is not present uh, when you look. So it's like looking at footprints in the snow or footprints in the dirt. You can see the fox, you can see the dead chickens or the feathers, and you know that something has been there. So the indirect methods include serology. This is the, that the body makes antibodies against the offending agent, and you can test for those. So typically what is done is you get a test before or, or during the infection and about three to four weeks uh, after to look for a rise in antibody against the uh, offending agent. There are, however, severe limitations, as you well know, uh, for example, if we were to check for measles, all of us have had measles or have had the vaccine, so that doesn't mean we have measles uh, infection. If, however, we get paired sera and the measles titer goes up by fourfold, uh, that is suggestive information that we may have had uh, measles. And the tests are used for multiple other uh, infections as well. So in conclude, concluding, there are several important points to take into consideration. The history is absolutely critical, where the patient came from, what the exposure is, what is the general condition of the patient, whether they are frail, whether they are immunosuppressed, malnourished, etc. The exposure meaning uh, what part of the world they live in, uh, whether they are rural or urban, or whether there are certain infectious agents known to be present in the area where the patient uh, is. The clinical presentation is absolutely critical, whether the patient is acutely uh, ill and has signs of chronic infection, such as weight loss, anorexia, uh, et cetera, whether they are localizing or systemic signs and symptoms. A careful physical examination is important. Lymphadenopathy or organ enlargement are critical findings and lead or direct you to certain diagnoses.
require treatment, travel history or location, and ethnic background, uh, particularly in the case of acquired infections or genetic diseases. The initial laboratory studies should be simple to do, have a quick turnaround time. In other words, come back very quickly and give you the most bang for the buck. In my opinion, a CBC is extremely helpful. Uh, the white count will be extremely helpful, whether it's uh, elevated, uh, decreased, whether you have a right or left shift, the characteristics of the white blood count. Blood chemistries are essential, liver enzymes to indicate or whether you have a more serious infections, CRP or CS, ESR, protein electrophoresis, as I've talked about before, your analysis, appropriate uh, radiographic studies. I would point out that don't be like our colleagues at UCLA where they get clinical genetic testing right off the bat to look for rare diseases. You must rule out infection, autoimmune disease, and cancer, and then you can start looking for the more rare uh, diseases, except in the case where there may be a positive family history. Think and approach the child symptomatically, uh, systematically and logically, taking all the information you collect and observe and formulate a thoughtful, orderly workup. Remember, infection and malignancies must be ruled out first. Also, inflammatory bowel disease can be very difficult to diagnose. I've had a number of children and adults who had inflammatory bowel disease with hardly any uh, GI symptoms at all. And therefore, uh, the diagnosis was not thought of for months uh, and in one case, years. So always read and keep up with the li literature. Read up every patient you see. Now, as you can tell, in a short time, we cannot cover in great detail the causes for recurrent and prolonged fever in children. So I'd like to reiterate again in those patients who have prolonged fever, think infection, infection, infection. After that, also consider cancer and autoimmune diseases and the other rare diseases, or less so and probably would be diagnosed or helped out by consultants. These references that you see are very uh, useful. Finishing up, I'd like to thank all of you for listening uh, to this lecture, although brief. I am an optimist, and I strongly believe that every child uh, deserves a healthy and happy life. Thank you again to the organizing committee, to Professor Chow, and to the Vietnamese Medical Association.